today is February 25th, 2021, and welcome to Mediation, the New Possibilities Hour. Today's uh, program features three very special speakers uh, who will be presenting different versions and different uh, areas of discussion on mediation as a profession. And so our first presenter will be um, uh, Lorraine Brennan, and uh, then followed up by the MC3 President and Vice President, uh, Jason Harper and Jack Gitz. Today, let's see, the uh, New Possibilities Hour is part of the Will Work for Food Project. The Will Work for Food Project was founded by Natalie Armstrong Moten last spring. And as you know, these programs every Thursday are presented at no charge. Everyone is just asked if they would be so kind as to make a donation to a food bank, either their local food bank or um, the one of the speakers preferred food banks. The audiences have been so generous so far. Um, Jeff, what's our total today? Jean, thank you so much. And Natalie, thank you so much for having founded this Will Work for Food project and the stewardship you've provided all along. The numbers are getting pretty high. The audiences, all of you watching are so generous, helping to fight food insecurity, and we want to thank you so much. The running total so far, 82,000. $770, an extraordinary amount of money to fight food insecurity. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much for your generosity. I mean, that's just incredible. And that's almost a million meals, uh, right, Natalie? Yeah, however you figure it. That's just fantastic. So thank you, Natalie, and thank you to Jeff Kachavin, who got involved with Will Work for Food uh, many months ago and uh, who has been spearheading then the, um, the New Possibilities Hour. So thank you both of you for your contributions and thank you for all of you who attend and donate so generously. Uh, today's uh, speakers, we're, like I said, we're going to start with uh, Lorraine Brennan. Um, Lorraine is an accomplished national and international dispute resolution professional. She is with JAMS and is primarily an arbitrator. Um, she is re recognized and respected for her broad range of professional experience involving complex commercial litigation, domestic and international arbitration and mediation, and her service as a distinguished global member of law school faculties from the United States to China. Uh, she also maintains leadership roles in multiple organizations, including Arbitral Women, the International and Dispute Resolution Sections of the American Bar Association and the Institute for Transnational Arbitration. She's an advisory board member. She is one of only eight members appointed by the U.S. State Department to serve on the NAFTA 2022 Advisory Committee on Private Commercial Disputes. Uh, she presently serves as an adjunct professor teaching international commercial arbitration at Georgetown University Law Center and has taught international business transactions at Cornell Law School. And uh, I hope I pronounce this correctly, Shantou, uh, you can correct me when you get the floor here, uh, Law School in China. And so with that, um, Lorraine, the floor will be yours. Could you please first tell us your preferred charity? It's not a food bank as such for the stomach, but it's a food bank for the mind for students. So can you tell us that? And then the floor is yours. Um, I grew up my life was um, transformed by books. And I found about this charity called DonorsChoose.org. I sponsor inner city school children um, who most of them have never owned their own book. So I make a donation, I fund a particular project, then the students write to me. I had a high school class in the Bronx act out Macbeth and one of them wrote to me and said, thank you so much. I've never had my own book. I can write in the margins. And I just started to cry. I, I couldn't imagine what it would be like not to have a book that you could write in as a kid. So that's been my favorite charity for over 10 years, but obviously I am interested in a lot of others as well, but I, it's, 
you know, I focus on inner city, um, mainly minority schools because they just don't have the funds. And you can give as little as $20 and that'll buy something. Or if you're feeling more generous, you can sponsor. I bought all the Macbeth books for the class. And then they sent me the photos of them acting out the play and it was magnificent. So that is my brain food charity. Okay, great. That's Donors Choose. Um, yeah. Right, Donors Choose. Is it .com? No, .org. .org. Okay, so DonorsChoose.org. Thank you so much. Lorraine? All right. Um, I'd like to start out because um, my father was an engineer, a master's in engineering, and he was always horrified that I never had a five-year plan. You need a five-year plan. I never had a plan. I had a goal. My goal was I love everything international. I majored in French literature at Cornell. I wanted an international career. And I have one now, but I didn't take any traditional paths. I, if you had told me 10 years ago, I'd be a mediator. I would tell you, you're, you know, you're smoking something because I started very much on a litigation arbitration path. And, um, you know, I clerked for a federal judge in the Southern District and I sat in on the settlement conferences and all of that. And I saw how pragmatic settling could be as opposed to a full-blown litigation. So I think that's where the first seed was planted. As a law firm um, attorney at, at several uh, very large firms, I was counsel in arbitrations and I had good and bad experiences. I had parties show up who had no intention of doing anything. Um, then I had an amazing mediator in New York. My adversary wouldn't even talk to me when we met. And by the end of the day, we had settled the case in one day. So that's the day I think I became a true believer in mediation and its power. I then was very, very lucky. I decided I wanted a mid-career break. So I went to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. And I took a course in mediation from Jeff Rubin, one of the directors of the uh, program on negotiation at Harvard. And the first couple of weeks, this was a mediation class. I was the worst student in the class because I wanted to fight like any litigator wanted to fight. And finally, Professor Rubin opened my eyes. You're going to get farther following these mediation schools that I'm uh, skills that I'm teaching you. Another big boon to that class was he'd say, "My friend Roger's coming next week." Well, it was Roger Fisher, and as someone who was not in the mediation world, I had no clue how lucky I was. Bob Manukin was a guest speaker. I mean, the whole list of people from the Harvard program came and talked to our little Fletcher class. And that, I just, then I really got hooked, read Getting to Yes and all of the, the standard books. Um, I worked for the ICC for nine years and I was on the committee to draft the 2004 mediation rules. Now, what was interesting about that was initially they weren't getting much use. ICC was at that time predominantly an arbitral institution and nobody really, especially the, our European friends, they weren't, they didn't want to mediate. They wanted to arbitrate. But my dear friend, David Plitt, who many of you may know, he's a fabulous mediator. He's passed on, but he wrote a book, We Talk Because We Must, very well known in mediation circles. He kept bugging me. The ICC has to make a competition out of these mediation rules. So I arranged a meeting. We did a conference on Cape Cod I had David drive down from New Hampshire, locked him in my hotel room, it was a suite, it wasn't nothing uh, untoward there. And Henry Whitesell from the ICC was there. And David pitched the idea, and I backed him, of the ICC mediation moot. It is now probably the biggest competition that the ICC does, and it has become extremely successful. But what's great about it, it has introduced a whole new generation of young people to mediation, which I think is incredible. So, um, and that competition continues to grow every year. It's, it's gotten a little too big for me. I mean, the first year we had, I think 13 teams and it was, you know, just so intimate and, and amazing and everybody 
was my birthday weekend and we had a dinner. The lights went out. Oh God, we've got no electricity. And they wheeled out the biggest birthday cake I've ever had in my life. So we'll never forget that first mediation move. I have been certified as a mediator by CEDAR in the UK. Um, they taught their course in the JAMS offices in New York. And the quid pro quo from our general counsel was that Lorraine gets to take the course. It was absolutely a wonderful course. And then of course, anybody who joins JAMS has to take arbitration and mediation training there as well. And those were excellent courses. I also did as much shadowing as I could possibly get my hands on, watching some of the best mediators at JAMS and elsewhere do their thing. And I have to tell you that really helped me a lot. I didn't incorporate everything because it wasn't my style necessarily, but I learned a lot. I've taught quite a few courses now on mediation. I just finished an ILI course, International Law Institute with some uh, Filipino government dignitaries. And their approach to mediation is way more casual than ours. They all sit in a room and talk about things. And so when I uh, expose them to the more American style, at least my style, which is facilitative, they were they loved it, but they said, oh my goodness, we don't have this in the Philippines. So I love teaching these international courses because you incorporate different cultural facets from everybody you meet. And I learn something every time. I think I learn as much as my students. I've also done a lot of the city bar uh, training courses uh, in New York with my friends, Dina Johansson and um, Kathy Robertson. So, you know, uh, whenever there's a course and they need another mediator or a judge, I, I volunteer because I think it's very important. One thing I want to say is I very strongly believe mediation is a profession. And those, may, there, those of you may disagree with me and say, no, it's a subset. No, it actually isn't. Um, it requires a very different skill set. You may be the best litigator on the planet and you'll, you may be a lousy mediator and vice versa. I mean, I didn't know that I would be a, a decent mediator because frankly, I, you know, my career was always fighting with people, it, not fighting, but, you know, literally um, controversial, um, controversies with other people. But I started seeing things that really bothered me. I was in a settlement conference when I was at Millbank as, as an associate and um, there was $1,000 left on the table. And there was another young associate, a male from another firm, although I'm not saying his gender made him be stubborn, it just, he was stubborn. But he said, so, all right, so how do we litigate the final 1,000? I said, are you out of your mind? We're gonna split it. You're paying 500 and we'll pay 500. It makes zero sense to litigate $1,000 when we're charging more than that for our hourly rate. No, I mean, I, it just showed to me such a lack of common sense. And what I like about so many of the mediators I work with or I've seen is the common sense element. I did an, a, a very big arbitration with um, a group of security guards from a very well-known clothing store. They were all from Africa. They weren't American, they were African. And they had gotten hired, you know, one of these bring your friend in, but they weren't unionized or anything like that. But they were great, great guys and they all got fired and they thought it was because they were black when in fact they got fired because the company was growing so fast they decided to unionize the security guards and go to like a, a company and, and use that. So I had 19, you know, plaint well, the plaintiffs, I, I call them uh, claimants and um, the, they had a novel theory about the sexual, uh, not sexual, I'm sorry, because I, I have sexual harassment cases too, but about the um, prejudicial um, effect of them being fired. And we were getting right down to the wire. I had already gotten them a lot of money and it, it just wasn't, you know, they were holding out. I gave them what I call my come to Jesus talk. This is what's gonna happen to you if you go to court. Wouldn't you rather leave today with money in your pocket? The usual things. 
but it wasn't really budging them. So I went to the, the company who was in the other room and I said, can you offer these gentlemen something that isn't gonna cost you a lot, but will settle this mediation? And they said, we can give them vouchers for clothes at our store. So when they go on job interviews, they'll be very well dressed in our store's clothes and we'll offer them unlimited job placement. And that was the element that drove the case to yes. And it was creative. It's not something I could have done as an arbitrator. And, but it settled the case. So I love the creative aspect of mediation. I, I can't really do that as much as an arbitrator because I'm following some very strict rules and some very strict law. So um, I've done, I did a sexual harassment case against a very big bank. And I realized it was really a misunderstanding what the woman thought was sexual harassment. And I was, she was very sympathetic was, um, witness and would have made one in court was really a, a misunderstanding of some terms that have been used that I never would have thought to, you know, interpret them that way. But she was hurt, and I think that she saw this case differently, but we were able to settle that case, and I was so proud because it, at the beginning of the day, the bank said they owed nothing, and I said, you may want to rethink that. I spent an hour talking to her. She's very sympathetic. She's very well educated, and you did just fire all the women on that team. Not a good look for you in court. So that case settled, and she was my first... Um, client and it, you know, I was had just really gotten into meeting. She said, can I give you a hug? I don't know if that was appropriate, but I said yes anyway. And uh, we all left with a really good feeling. Um, personally, and I've done many, many arbitrations and neutral evaluations and all of that. I actually find mediation more challenging and uh, I'll tell you why. Um, I know all the rules in an arbitration. They're right there in front of me. I've got the rules. I've got the, you know, the law, um, governing law. I've got the um, substantive, you know, the procedural law. I've got a set of rules. Mediation to me, I walk out of a mediation feeling like a wet dish rag because I've given so much of my personality and my persuasive skills. And that's why I love a good mediation because I never know what's gonna happen. And I never know what's really gonna get the parties to settle at the end of the day. It can be something I never would have thought of in a million years. So I actually find mediation more challenging, but exhilarating when you can settle. You know, I still get clients that come in there and they tell me we're not offering a thing. And I'm like, well, you've got me for the day, you paid for me, let's talk. And We'll talk for maybe an hour or so, but they literally won't budge. And those clients, you're always going to find them. Sorry, they just exist. But um, I've done a lot of international cases. I just did a big case. Um, in, well, it was supposed to be in Paris, much to my chagrin. It ended up online, but we were all against that. We, we had three mediators, two French mediators, and then myself. I also speak French, but it was conducted in a bilingual fashion, but what was difficult about it was that the mediators, we were, we didn't think an online mediation with that many parties was going to work because mediation is so personal. We, you know, you take the person into the room, you're sitting there, but actually given how many parties there were, and I think there were over 40 parties, we found it much more controlled in that Everybody had their own room. There were no fist fights. There was no storming out to the elevator, no theatrics like that. And while the case didn't settle because it was too early on, we didn't have enough facts. The parties didn't have enough facts. I actually am now, it's not my first choice, but you know, during COVID, I have found online mediation and I teach my Georgetown class now online. It's actually working out a lot better than I ever expected, especially because my students, I can see all their names. I call on them constantly. They love it. So, um, you know, I don't know what the future of online mediation will be. I think a lot of parties are realizing 
you know, had we all gone to Paris, it would have been millions of dollars in plane fares, hotels. It was at least a two week mediation, maybe three. So we saved millions of dollars um, by doing it online. So I'm kind of taking a wait and see attitude as to, you know, whether parties will continue to like the online system or whether they really want to go back to, you know, bricks and mortar being in the building, looking people in the eye. Um, you know, I'm, I don't know. I mean, for me, I would do either. And I found that both have worked well, but um, I have someone now who he's really put me in a bind. He has, initially he said, this is over a year ago, I'm not coming to New York. That's too expensive. It's ridiculous. We need to do this online. Then COVID hit. He goes, well, um, I'm not doing this online. That's a violation of my client's rights. And he said, and I'm not flying to New York because I'm too old. I haven't had my, you see, he literally kind of put his client in a box where he won't do it online and he won't do it in real life. And I understand that I would not travel to New Orleans right now, which is where he is to do a mediation. So, um, you know, we'll work that out in other ways. His client needs to know what's going on. But um, I just find this new adaptation to this new platform, the um, really the flexibility of people and some people that were really poo-pooing the whole online idea, now that they've done it, and now that I've taught online and mediated online and even arbitrated online, um, I'm a believer that it can work. I'm not saying it's my preferred way to go, but it, it's certainly, I haven't had any issues at all. Excuse me, L Lorraine, we have a couple of questions and I know you wanted questions during your chat. We have a few minutes left. And the questions are kind of related. One asks, why is mediation a profession? Define profession. What else would you call it if it is not a profession? And the related question is the role of non-attorney mediators, so mediators from backgrounds other than law. The reason I call it a profession is half of my colleagues at JAMS do nothing but mediate. That is their profession. They don't arbitrate. They are full-time mediators. Uh, most of you know Danny Weinstein. He's a prolific mediator at JAMS. That is his profession. So I, I don't understand why anybody would say that's a sideshow. That's all he does. And frankly, he's darn good at it. Um, you know, so we have in JAMS, we have people that just mediate. We have people that just arbitrate. And then people like me who do both. So if you can make $20 million a year mediating, I say you have a profession. I'm not making that, but I'm saying there are people that do. The second question, um, can you, I'm sorry, can you just? Yes, it was as we define, I mean, a profession is not really defined by whether people make money at it or not. Profession is defined by commonly accepted standards, things of that nature, perhaps some of the things that Jack and Jason will get into in a few minutes. The question is whether the definition of profession is restricted to people from a legal background or how do we define it as a profession so that it's sufficiently flexible to accommodate people from different backgrounds? Well, first of all, I've done quite a few mediations. The one I did in France, one of the French mediators was not, he was a law professor. So he was there to give his knowledge of the law. He didn't claim to be a mediator, but he sure as hell helped the procedure because he knew exactly uh, was French insurance law was the one of the issues. And I certainly didn't know anything about it and the other mediator as well. But what, what I think needs to happen personally is I think there needs to be more unification of training. Because right now, anybody can call themselves a mediator, no matter where they got training. I, I mean, the, it, it's too lax, in my opinion. I think there needs to be certification. I think that will help more and more in the belief that it is indeed a profession. But my, my worry with mediation now is, 
you know, there are people that, you know, they call themselves a mediator, but what training have they had? What experience have, had, have they had? I want to know all those things before I choose a mediator. So for me, I would like to see, not like the bar exam, obviously, but I would like to see some type of certificate training and, you know, that's worthwhile, that, you know, maybe a two-week training. I know CPR does great training. Um, Cedar did a great training, but I think there needs to be more uniformity in training. And then I'll add another thing. I know so many people that have taken arbitration training and they've passed. That doesn't make them a good arbitrator. Just because you take a mediation course doesn't mean you're going to be a good mediator. The proof is in the pudding when you get out there and get into a mediation and then parties start spreading it around. I had a great experience with X, Y, and Z. But I think it is a profession. You're right, it isn't about how much money you make. But for me, it's a different skill set than being an arbitrator. And well, Lorraine, there's a school of mediation that's very highly evaluative, mm -hmm. very highly directive, and that some people criticize as being unduly uh, ham-handed. How would you define a kind of uniform training that might accommodate that kind of mediation, which for many people is quite successful in the marketplace, with the more Roger Fisher getting to yes kind of approach that we commonly learn in negotiation mediation trainings in law school, identifying interests, separating people from the problem, evaluating, generating options and evaluating them and allowing for greater self-determination in the process. How would you design a two-week training that would accommodate the many different kinds of mediation that seem to find some acceptance in the marketplace? Well, I mean, first of all, I have chosen to be a facilitative mediator. I am not a transformative mediator. I know some people are. I don't think that's my job, but I think the parties need to know up front what is your mediation style. And I'm very honest with them, it's facilitative. I'm not here to tell you what to do. Now that said, at the end of the day, if the parties say, I want a mediator's proposal, will I do that? Um, yeah, if, if, if it seems that it's appropriate, I will do that. But only at the party's request. I don't shove anything down the party's throat. So, I'm not really sure those can be encompassed necessarily. I mean, I suppose they could, but it's very hard to teach someone three different techniques like that, facilitative, evaluative, transformative in one course, because they're so, at least transformative, so completely different than facilitative. Yeah, do, do you give evaluative feedback during mediations? As, as far as what? with. I mean, I and take. Do you do you engage in evaluation during your mediations? Only when the parties are separated. I don't do it in front of the parties, uh, in front of the whole group. I can, so, so, in your concept, even though you call yourself, I mean, this is what to me makes it very difficult to cabin and really figure out uh, how to define the profession when even someone who calls themselves a you know, a, a straightforward facilitative mediator, you do give evaluative um, feedback. I mean, it just underscores to me the complexity and um, challenge that we face in defining what the profession really is, what the standards are, what behaviors and kinds of intervention are okay and, and not okay. It's a very, don't you agree that it's just a very challenging, complicated arena? Absolutely. But Jeff, given my background as a litigator, and I know what the courts are going to do. Am I remiss if I have the parties in one room, if I don't tell them the risks in their case? I think I am. So I guess I could, maybe that is too evaluative, but they don't have to accept what I'm saying. Right. You know, I, it just seems to me, Lorraine, that as you were saying earlier, perhaps the most important thing is to be transparent about what it is that you do and you don't do because the marketplace will decide, right? The, the, there are some people who will want exactly what you have to offer and some people who 
may not. And there's a wide variety of mediators doing a wide variety of different things out there. And to the extent we're being selected by lawyers who are a pretty sophisticated crowd to perform the services, transparency about what we offer may be the key to, uh, to our success as individual practitioners and as a, as a profession. With that, we're at the bottom of the hour, believe it or not. Yeah, it's hard to believe. Please Thank forgive you. me, it was a fascinating presentation. Forgive me if I interrupted, but we did have no, the questions wanted, come up. Questions, Jeff. I appreciate questions. Great. Okay, Jean. Yes. Great. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And Jean Lawler, back to you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Lorraine. For anyone who wants to reach out to Lorraine, she is with ADR and uh, uh, Jams, excuse me, jamsadr.com is the email, uh, the website address. So uh, you can find her there on the Jams website. Uh, for under neutrals, and I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to anybody. Awesome. Thank you again so much. And the last part of this discussion ties right in with the next uh, the next half of this hour, and that is uh, by the MC3 uh, Mediation Certification um, Organization. And for that, we have two wonderful speakers: uh, the president and vice president of MC3. Jack Getz is the president of MC3. He's a lecturer in law at the University of Southern California Gould School of Law, teaching mediation theory and practice. As a neutral, he serves the public privately, as well as serving on various public panels, uh, on a, a number of panels, I, the, the, well, FINRA, uh, for example, and he's a mediator for the Ventura County Superior Court. He's served as a temporary judge and his credentials just go on and on and on. You can find more about Dr. Getz on the MC3 website, and I know he wants to talk, so I won't go on about uh, the credentials there for right now, just say he's got them and it's wonderful. Uh, Jason Harper is vice president of MC3. He is an ADR consultant and conflict management coach, uh, adjunct professor and trainer. He uh, serves on the faculty at both the University of Southern California Gould School of Law and the Pacific Coast University School of Law. His area of practice is uh, fascinating to me. It's education and then employment and workplace uh, mediations, cross-cultural disputes, and he's a sociologist. Uh, so uh, both of these gentlemen bring very interesting backgrounds to the discussion and the floor is yours, gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you so much. I want to say a quick thank you to, to Gene Lawler, Natalie Armstrong, and Jeff Kitchhaven for having us. Uh, I greatly appreciate uh, affording us the time and the space. And it's great to see so many folks from so many different places. Uh, you know, it's it's an honor and privilege to be in front of all of you. Um, just to speak briefly about the, uh, the, the food bank or the nonprofit that we wanted to highlight, we wanted to specifically highlight the Long Beach Rescue Mission. Now it's a local uh, food bank in the city of Long Beach, California. Um, but what they do is they care for those who are homeless and less fortunate through food, shelter, clothing, and, and other critical needs. You know, one of the things that, uh, that we've seen uh, throughout this global pandemic is uh, a lot of food insecurity uh, and worse. And so, uh, you know, we, we really appreciate the uh, Will Work for Food program uh, and, and shedding a light on the fact that folks need help and, uh, and the fact that you're doing that is, uh, is a great thing. So with that in mind, uh, you know, I just wanted to make sure we got that clear and, and, and put that out to make sure, and, and I'll put the, uh, the link in the chat for everyone to, uh, to be able to look at the uh, Long Beach Rescue Mission and, and hopefully donate. So with, oh, Natalie Armstrong just did it. Thank you so much, Natalie, very appreciative. So with that in mind, I wanted to uh, you know, introduce myself and Jack. Uh, we are uh, the, uh, the head of, uh, of MC3, which is a uh, mediator certification organization. Uh, and what we wanted to do is kind of open it up and talk about mediation as a profession, uh, and particularly in the United States. I know we have some, some international folks in the house today, but, uh, but I wanted to spend a few minutes and, and just talk a little bit about that. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. We have a, a few slides uh, to show everyone. Uh, just to kind of um, to really highlight some of the points that we're going to make. And, uh, and I will uh, ask that uh, Dr. Getz, Jack, uh, you start things off. So with that in mind, I'm going to uh, go full screen. And uh, Jack, you got it. Well, thank you, Jason. Uh, 
probably don't need the first slide. Uh, everybody knows who we are by now, but thank you so much. So um, I really appreciate uh, everybody inter interest in this program. I've actually done a lot of work in this area about mediation, particularly as it presents itself in the United States. So I have a lot to say about the sociology of it. And I've worked with the sociologists very closely. And we released an article in 2014, which talked about mediation as a profession. But uh, there's been so much written about it, so much done. Uh, so I may have a, a few different thoughts than uh, have already been surfaced, although uh, Lorraine and Jeff did a great job of, of teeing it up. Uh, in 2016, Professor Art Hinshaw released an article in the Harvard Negotiation Law Review about regulating mediators and introduced this whole subject to us. And nothing about MC3 is about regulation. And as Jason says, we're, we've been mostly focused in the United States. But one of the things that uh, Professor Hinshaw writes in the article uh, is we are in the other 60%. So in the United States, just keeping focus on 40% of the United States workforce is subject to some sort of occupational regula regulation. It may, uh, it may include registering at the government, completing a certain amount of education, passing examination, and or demonstrating a minimal degree of competency in an objective way. And, and Hinshaw puts that out there. It's research that's been done, but it's obvious for most of us, if we think seriously about mediation, and if it's not a profession, it's certainly a field. If we think about it as a field, uh, we don't really qualify for the 40%. There, there's no, no uniformity. Uh, most of the time, we don't have to do anything. Most of the certifications and when you're qualified as a mediator are panel oriented. Uh, so you could literally be certified in, in uh, you know, New York City by some panel and, and drive upstate to Albany and suddenly not be certified. So, you know, it's, it's really, uh, that's how mediation is in the United States, at least the current status of it. Jason, do you want to go to the next? So, yeah, one of the things that, uh, you know, that, that both Jack and I have, uh, have had the pleasure and privilege of doing is uh, we've served as presidents of uh, one of the largest, uh, well, the largest association of mediators in the state of California and, and one of the largest in the country, uh, and that would be the SCMA. Uh, and during both of our terms serving as president, we heard a lot of comments in regards to mediation and how it's regarded uh, by the general public. And a lot of a lot of our membership at the time said that we don't get the respect that we deserve as mediators. And they felt as though they deserve as much respect for their work as, as counsel um, as, you know, since they're just as professional. Uh, and by counsel referring to attorneys, of course, and, and they were tired of everyone expecting uh, mediators to give away their services for free. Now, I think a lot of that is a, is a, is a consequence of, you know, the, the work that folks do in community mediation centers and, and other, you know, DERPA organizations. By the way, DERPA, for those playing at home, stands for Dispute Resolutions Programs Act, which is, uh, which is a type of uh, program, uh, particularly in California. Um, so, you know, that, those types of things are connected. Uh, you know, the fact that they felt the, the perception that everyone was expecting everyone to mediators to give their services for free and, and a lack of respect for the profession itself. Um, you know, I, I think those things might just be connected. And the common experience in small claims court is that disputants generally couldn't describe what a mediator does without being given an explanation. Um, but on the other hand, if you were to ask them, you know, what does an accountant do? Or what does an attorney do? Or what does a nurse do? Or what does a teacher do? Uh, you know, they can, for the most part, with about 80, 85, almost 90% accuracy, be able to explain to you what those professions do. But there's a, there's a, there's a gap when it comes to talking about what a mediator does. And so, you know, we're wondering if those things are connected whether uh, a lack of you know, basic understanding of what a mediator does versus having the respect um, as a profession. Um, and also the idea that, well, I mean, I, it, you're a mediator. I'm, I can, I'm sure I can get a mediation at, at low cost or for free, um, which also speaks to you know, a perception of, of respect for, for, that given, uh, for that given field. So, Excellent. yeah, yeah. go ahead, Jack. All right, so what is a profession? I mean, in the United States at least, what constitutes a formalized profession? And we can, and we can think about it 
around some basic principles. So generally a formalized profession, uh, which gains the respect of the public has a certain degree linked to it for the most part, which of course we do not have a mediation. Now we have a couple of degrees that are highly prominent in our field. And what are those degrees? They're obviously, as Lorraine already mentioned, and many of you know, a JD degree oftentimes leads someone to the track of mediation. But also uh, what's emerging now are more and more students who have uh, postgraduate degrees in conflict resolution. So those are, are possibilities for us. Uh, and in fact, of the you know, certified mediators that are already have listed with MC3, over 80% of them have either a JD or postgraduate degree in conflict resolution or both. There's a binding ethics code. Now, if you do the research on it, which uh, I have done, we have tons of ethics codes throughout the United States. And, and you know, the one that you hear about the most is the ABA, ACR, AAA, uh, 2005 a model code for mediators. Uh, Although nothing's agreed upon. And if you look at the dozens or so of other ethics codes that abound, even court ethics code, they don't disagree by much. There's, there's little variations on the theme. We do have the basics, I think, to draw a ethics code for the profession if we were inclined to do so. Uh, but certainly a binding ethics code is part of what's important uh, to forming a formalized profession. Formalized profession needs to be self-governing. That means it has to have a methodology for weeding the non-quality practitioners out. And we can think about that more broadly. Uh, you know, when you think about licensing, which this is not about, but if you think about a lawyer or an accountant or whatever, um, they do have processes if you have a bad practitioner uh, to weed them out, certainly a non-ethical one. There would be uh, complaints launched to the, the state body, et cetera. But to actually elevate in the public's mind to a formalized profession, some a profession they can trust, um, a person they can call up individually uh, rather than going through some intermediary, oftentimes you have to be self-governing. And as Lorraine mentioned, I, you know, passing the bar exam, passing the CPA exam, you know, passing the medical boards, none of, the, none of these say that you're going to be a good doctor, a good accountant, uh, or a, a, you know, a good lawyer. But they do say that you understand some basics. And so we do need some, something in our field that emulates that if we really aspire to be a profession. Continuing education, it's part of the model in everybody's. And, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of our practitioners, once they get to the status of mediator, stop their education. Uh, and so, you know, we would have to incorporate into a model if we sought to be a formalized profession, some sort of continuing education. And then if it's licensing, which again, is not what MC3 is about, there's often a test. Uh, there's some sort of objective test. We're all familiar with the stories. And some of us have, you know, I'm a lawyer as well. Some of us have, have been part of the story of, you know, having to survive licensing tests. But there's often a test. Um, so, again, currently mediation doesn't require any of these. Uh, but other professions have that, that provide. And the, the bottom line is providing quality assurance to the public. Um, and so the MC3 proposition, as we formed it, and you know this was eight years in the formation, is that providing more quality assurance for mediators will ultimately pave the way for direct public interaction with mediators, not going through intermediaries. And of course, in some select areas of mediation, we do have that. You know, family law is famous for having that direct connection where someone feels comfortable calling a mediator. But if we want to think about how mediation can be on, as it were, speed dial for people in conflict, uh, we would have to have more of a formalized profession approach to our field. Yeah. And, and just to kind of piggyback on that, I know one of the, uh, the comments that, uh, that I saw in the chat was, how do we define respect? Uh, and, and people feel respected as mediators. And I think uh, anecdotally, I can, I can list a number of folks who, who have respect uh, for mediators and mediation because of their personal experience with it. But I think what we're talking about is a mass, uh, a general 
respect and regard for mediation in the same way as other formalized professions. Uh, because there's, you know, really a, a gray area when it comes to education. Um, you know, oh, well, I went to a 30-hour mediation training. I went to a 40-hour. Well, I got a master's degree in, in dispute resolution. Uh, I, I, have an, I have a JD or I have an LLM. Um, you know, because of that gray area, there isn't really a, a standard uh, that, is, that is really seen by the general public. Uh, the, the ethics code, um, you know, if you ask mediators, they might know, your, your, your average mediator, they might know, but the general public wouldn't necessarily know about that ethics code. Uh, all of those things relate to the respect as, as we refer to it, um, you know, in, in regards to mediation as a, as a profession. And uh, there, was another, uh, there was another statement that was made uh, at the National Conflict Resolution Center back in 2006 that said, if we don't decide practice standards for ourselves, someone else will do it for us. And that actually brings to mind a, a particular uh, issue that came up a few years back in California, the LA Superior Court, which is the, the largest court in the land, as it were. Um, they, uh, years past, they had done away with their dispute resolution uh, section and, uh, or their mediation section. And, and what they ended up doing was they tried to do another pilot program to bring it back. And the, the standards that they were looking for, the qualifications that they were looking for for mediators, for mediators, mind you, was 10 years of active bar membership, 10 years of active bar membership, and 20 hours of mediation training, uh, of mediation practice, but 32 hours of training. Now, obviously, it's a superior court. They specialize in litigation. They were going with, with what they know. However, uh, I think that a lot of mediators would have a hard time seeing those particular requirements and seeing a, a legitimate mediator in that um, or with just those parameters. Uh, because with those parameters, you're, you're exiting out and you're sectioning off a, a huge swath of the mediation population or the mediator population. Um, so that is something that, you know, that's how the LA Superior Court defined a mediator in essence. And so with those types of with those types of standards, that eliminates a, a wide range of folks. And so a wide range of mediators, of professional mediators. And so because of that, we that that's the that's the that's a sign right there that we need to be able to, to define the practice for ourselves as opposed to others defining it for us. Yeah, Jason, I would add the bottom uh, bullet point, sacred cow mediator confidentiality remains a risk should we not develop a methodology for quality assurance. If you think about it, most uh, across at least the United States, if you have a confidentiality situation, it relates to the uh, credentials of the person involved in the dialogue. So you, if you have an attorney client privilege, it has to do with the fact that the attorney is qualified in some way, a doctor patient privileges, and we can go on and on. Mediation, we have this confidentiality privilege that extends because of the process, uh, not because of the qualifications of the mediator. And indeed, that has led to some issues uh, over, over the years. In California, certainly we've seen uh, a number of assaults on mediator confidentiality, and it partially links back to this concept of no one's ever really qualified in an objective way, the person sitting at the other end of the conversation. And certainly some people look at the Uniform Mediation Act, which I'm not sure all the states that have checked in here that may be prevalent in your state. And some people see that as an incursion on some aspects of confidentiality. But again, we haven't yet as a field established ourselves that the person at the other end of the conversation is a qualified practitioner according to the standards for the field, not according to LA Superior Court or, or whatever that may say 10 years of practicing law, that's enough. Uh, even if you were practicing as a tax attorney. Uh, all right, thanks, Jason. So uh, Jack, do you wanna talk about the uh, ADA yeah, task will, force report? I will, and, and I wanna be conscious of our time and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. So. Absolutely. Um, when MC3 formed, we, <laughs> you know, talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. There were two major task force reports uh, that had been released about how to certify mediator without taking necessarily a, a position on whether or not mediator should be certified. If the, the prospect of the reports was, the backdrop was, 
if mediators were to be certified, this is what the organization should do. Uh, one that we've anchored ourselves to from MC3 standpoint is one that was released by the ABA task force uh, in 2012. And it lists six principles that mediate, you know, the certification organization should look, should have, should maintain. Uh, and you can see the clearly define the skills, knowledge and values. And we certainly think we do that. Um, ensure that candidates have training adequate to instill those skills. We, we certainly hope we do that. This one's a big one. Be administered by an organization distinct from the organization which trains the candidate. So if you look how the word certification is used in the United States, lots of times what will happen is you'll go to a program and they'll say, you're certified. And we educated it, therefore you must be certified. And of course the ABA had a different way of looking at saying that the public cannot develop the trust it needs. The organization cannot develop the objectivity if it links its own education to the ultimate certification. That doesn't mean those of you and those of eh, those of you, me included, that doesn't mean what we did wasn't good. It was good stuff. I'm just saying to stand as a certification organization, you need to be separate and apart from that. And indeed, MC3 does no education on its own. It's simply it processes education that people have, mediators have received in other venues. There's some other, like I said, there were six check marks of what you have to do. Have an assessment process capable of determining with consistency whether candidates possess the defined skills, knowledge, and values. And consistency, again, it's open to interpretation. The ABA prefers a more objective process. So the the processes where certification depends upon someone looking in on your mediation and saying, hmm, I think that person's good or that person's not good would be, we believe, rejected by this report. And so we don't have that kind of process. Uh, explain clearly to persons likely to rely on its credential what is being certified. And again, we hope we have done that. But here's the sixth one. Provide an accessible, transparent system to register complaints against credentialed mediators, promptly and fairly investigate complaints. Uh, that's the self-governing part of being a profession. If we don't accept that, then we will, we will never get to that place of quality assurance for the public that we hope to reach so that we can be on the speed dial. Yeah. And and then, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, no, but then there are some things that, uh, that the ABA task force should recommended that it would not do, a credentialing program would not do. Right, and that's operate as mandatory licensing. That's that's very important. Uh, barring non-lawyers from becoming credentialed, uh, that was extremely important. And I think that uh, that speaks to uh, you know not just barring non-JD uh, mediators, but also uh, you know when we talked about some of the earlier aspects, it speaks to allowing for the diversity of mediators. You know, when we talk about the diversity, obviously it's, it's it goes beyond just uh, ethnicity and race and all of those things and gender but really the style of mediation, right? Whether it's a facilitative or it's evaluative or transformative, those styles, they're very diverse styles of, of mediation. So it's important to make space for that as well. And, uh, and the last point, uh, you know, it, it should not bar disputants from selecting a non-credentialed mediator. And so those are some of the things that, uh, that we wanted to mention uh, in regards to, uh, to the efforts for mediator certification, the rationale behind it. Um, and we want to make space for any questions. So, uh, you know, if, uh, if you want to look for more information, um, feel free to go to our website, which is www.mc3certified.org. Uh, you'll find uh, a great amount of information, uh, more information on the, the reasoning behind uh, mediator certification, as well as uh, some of the qualifications that, uh, that have been listed, uh, you know, for MC3 certification. So uh, with that in mind, uh, thank you very much. And, and if we have any questions, we would love to take them now. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, Jack. Um, go for the questions and Jeff's gonna handle the questions. Uh, this, you've got a lot of chatter in the chat. So this is really an interesting <laughs> topic. So let me ask a, a question, Jack and Jason, which is how the, the, the other pan of the scale, if you will, the demand side of the equation. How do people find out that what this is, it's, you know, there's an alphabet soup of organizations and credentials and all that. And how do people know, the consumers know that this credential 
um, exists and what it stands for and that people should look for it and or, or apply to this or any other credential? Jeff, I'll, I'll take my first stab at it and welcome Jason's comments. Uh, you're right. I mean, this is, as I like to tell our organization, we're only in the second year of our 100-year history. And it's going to take a while to permeate the consumer market. What it depends upon is mediators believing and wanting to step up to a level, which is an objective assessment, uh, and being able to stand forward and say, I've adopted this ethics code, which is the ABA code for us, and, and I've adopted these standards. And then also for various panels in the community to also accept those credentials. And of course, MC3 is working on all those as we speak. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it just takes time and, uh, and, and adoption from, uh, from the mediators and, and from the organizations as well. Okay, there has been so much, uh, a lot of comments going forward in the chat. If anybody has- I noticed, Jeff, I noticed. Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys are <laughs> provoking a lot of thought on the part of the participants, which is just wonderful. Thank you. If there's anybody who has a specific narrow question, which we could pose in the remaining three minutes of the program, <laughs> please pop it in that we like to start on time and end on time. Please pop it in the chat right now. Well, it's, I don't think there's a specific narrow question that's coming up, Jack. <clears throat> and Jason, is there one last uh, point that you just got to get off your chest that's so important for people to know that we mustn't end without it? Well, I'll go first, and then Jason maybe has a, another point. But MC3 has been around for one year, and, and like all businesses, uh, you know, nonprofit businesses, certainly, we're all affected by the pandemic. But we currently have mediators in four different states uh, who have uh, been certified and a number on our directory. If you went to our website, you'd see. So we're pleased with its acceptance so far amongst the mediation field. And we look forward to a fantastic future. Jason? Yeah, I, I guess the last thing that I would say is, um, you know, one of the things that, I, that really speaks to me is, is the fact that I feel as though mediation is a calling uh, for me. And it's, it's something that, you know, I prepared my whole life for, you know, I, I was born the third out of six. And so uh, in essence, I've been playing mediator uh, for a while. I just recently started getting paid for it. But, um, but what I will say is when you find that, you know, when you, when people go to mediation training, they go for a number of different reasons. Some go for, you know, added skills to, you know, apply to their current career, which might be in HR or might be in counseling or might be in another of a, a number of other areas. But if, if you feel as though mediation is your calling and, and you feel that it is your life's work, um, I'm of the belief, I'm of the philosophy that if, if you're called to do something, you, you learn all that you can to do it well. And I think that you know, the, the things that MC3 is putting together the, from an education standpoint, from a performance standpoint, and from a continuing education standpoint, I think speaks to uh, the calling uh, that some people feel that they have uh, when it comes to mediation, and so I would I would highly uh, I would highly suggest that you check out mc3certified.org and uh, and take a look. Okay, yes. let me just re uh, re thank you, Gene. Turn it back to you in a minute. Just want to repeat that number that we're up to eighty two thousand. Our audiences, it's not us, it's the audiences, have contributed eighty two thousand seven hundred and seventy dollars to fight food insecurity around the world. Thank you all so much. Uh, Jean, back to you. Thank you also. I just echo Jeff's comments there. There are questions certainly in the chat that haven't been answered. Somebody just uh, pointed that out to me. Um, I would encourage any of you to reach out directly to I, any of the three speakers. I'm sure that they would be more than happy to engage in conversation with you or answer other questions you may have. And um, have a good week, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thanks again so much. Bye-bye.